to breathe your life into these fragile bones are you willing to feed the deepest hunger of my your burden on my heart anoint me for your cause take the song upon my lips let it praise the one who lived and died and rose the one who was and is and is to come Jesus activate my heart take it home break me apart before your mighty throne and take this life to make your glory To breathe your life into these fragile bones. Are you willing to feed the deepest hunger of my soul? your burden on my heart anoint me for your cause take the song upon my lips let it praise the one who lived and died and rose the one who was and is and is to come Jesus activate my heart take it all break me apart before your mighty throne and take this life to make your glory Take this song upon my lips, let it praise the one who lived and died and rose, the one who was and is and is to come. Jesus, activate my heart, take it home, break me apart before your mighty throne, and take this life. To make your glory known Would you pray with me for a moment? Lord, as we've heard sung and have meditated on these words, we join this prayer that you would place a burden on our hearts today. Anoint us for your cause that we may make your glory known 
in this world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome to worship at Pierce this morning, whether you're here with us in person or joining us online. We're glad you could be with us on this beautiful, gorgeous fall Sunday after everyone got an extra hour of sleep. I thought we'd be packed by this time, like everybody was up, ready to go, had their extra coffee, but here we are. We're glad to have you here. I want to introduce Denise Murray to you. She'll be helping a little bit later in the service with Scripture and Communion. Denise is a student at Northeastern Seminary in her last year, and she comes from uh, South America where she served for 21 years on the mission field, and she's preparing her heart and life to to return and serve God uh, in those places. So we're glad for you to be here, Denise, and look forward to having you be part of our service. She's been a part of Pierce attending since last fall, so maybe you haven't had a chance to meet her yet, but hopefully you'll get a chance to do that today or in the coming weeks. Today we are celebrating communion, and so if you're watching at home and would like to take a moment to prepare that yourself for that, if you're not ready, we encourage you to, to get some juice and bread. And this is the Sunday of the month. We also take an exit offering. As you depart from the service today, you can you give an exit offering in the boxes as well as your usual tithes and offerings. The exit offering goes this week toward the Thanksgiving Community Food Basket Ministry. And there's, besides giving, there's several ways you can help out. You can check that out online at our piercechurch.org webpage or sign up at the welcome desk to assist with the uh, packing of boxes and preparing them to share with over a thousand families in our region at Thanksgiving time. Also, if you haven't received the Pierce Pulse, which is our weekly communication from Pierce that comes out on Friday around noon, I encourage you to sign up for that. You can read about what's going on in the life of the church. You can read my pastor's post. I know at least my mom reads it, so maybe some more of you would read that. Um, I'll just put in that shameless plug. Uh, You also get prayer updates on things you can be praying for in the life of our church. So sign up at at our website or at the welcome desk if you are not receiving the Pierce Pulse that comes out by by email. And then finally, if uh, you're a, a parent with young children and you want a break, we've got a great plan for you. This Friday night from 6 to 8 p.m., free child care, food and entertainment and provision and care for your children while you get a chance to have a night out to do what you would like to do. So we encourage you to be a part of that and, and sign up for it and, and just enjoy a time that evening where you can be refreshed and encouraged while you know your children are well cared for. Well, we're here to worship the Lord together, so let's prepare our hearts for worship as we are called into worship. Good morning, church. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. I want to welcome you to stand and join me in this time of worship as we lift one voice in praise. And our reading this morning is from Daniel 7, 13 to 14. In my vision at night, I looked And there before me was one like a son of of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed.
make music for thy Lord to hear. me this morning in our gospel reading for this morning's service, coming from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 20 through 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought together in complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me.
So I want to invite you, if you would like to come before God's presence in a very physical way, move toward the altar and stand here before the Lord as a place where you can call out to him in prayer and bring your need and your concern for yourself or for another to him this morning. The one who is our Lord, the one that we worship, the one whose name is above every name. Feel free to make your way to this altar, this place of prayer, and bow humbly in the presence of God Almighty. If you need to sit down as we pray, feel free to, seat, to be seated. Continue to stand just in an attitude of openness and prayer and love and gratitude to God for who he is and all that he means to us. Oh God, we come before you humbly this morning. We praise your name for you are good. You are gracious. You are full of compassion and love for all of us and all of humanity and for this wonderful world that you have created and blessed with your presence by coming to be one of us, one with us, God, in the flesh, Emmanuel. And Lord, we praise you this morning and we recognize that your name is holy. And we have prayed those words of the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray it would be so. We pray it would begin in our own hearts and lives here gathered this morning or watching online to just listen to your voice, to receive the, the, the goodness of God in ourselves, to recognize the, the holy nature of God, the holy love of God for us and for the whole world, that we may bask in the presence of God and humbly confess our sin to you and call out to you for healing and hope and deliverance, deliverance from our sin, forgiveness, uh, deliverance from the things that, that bind us and tie us and enslave us and hold us. Deliverance, Lord, from conflict and hatred and discord in our lives, in our world. Lord, help Pierce to be a church that has a place of peace, a place where your name is revered and welcomed and where we lift up the name of Jesus in such a way that you transform our lives and make us one with you and one with one another. Lord, we pray for the healing of the ill in our midst, those who are home, those who can't be here, those who are struggling. I, I lift up Mary Jane Devontu, who's had some medical issues and is in the hospital. Lord, watch over her and continue to heal and work in her body. I pray for my friend Joan, who's struggling, and ask you to minister to her today and bring your healing and strength and wisdom and peace. Lord, we pray for our hearts to be continually open to you today as we listen to your word as we share in the message of hope that the gospel is for all of us, Lord, inspire and encourage us. Bless those who are in need today who have come forward and those who remain where they're standing or sitting uh, to know that you are near, that you are present, that you will answer the cry of their hearts. As they draw near to you, you will draw near to them. You are drawing near to them now. Bring your comfort, healing, peace, whatever is needed, and we give you praise and thanks. And we offer all this prayer to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and to his honor and glory. Amen. And this is our opportunity to respond to the Lord. These are really great lyrics. We're going to sing all of the earth. We make up the earth, so let's sing this out. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing.
be seated at this time. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Good to see you here and those that are watching us online. Please join me uh, for our sermon scripture this morning. It is taken from Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made him the two groups, one and has destroyed the barriers, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. God bless the reading of his word. Cross-cultural collaboration. Cross-cultural collaboration. Cross-cultural collaboration. Cross-cultural collaboration is together with others that don't look like me, don't sound like me. You come together and worship together and work together and do life together. It's um, not just a one-way street at all because we all can do a lot of learning, especially when we all have these different cultures and these different backgrounds. It's really truly seeing the other and, uh, and celebrating that other, right? And celebrating the diversity of another person and seeing their gifts for the kingdom of God. It means that we're free to co-labor with other people, whether it's here locally, um, or in other nations. Well, having other cultures um, in leadership and being immersed in different cultures will always make people learn more. And it's gonna take you out of your comfort zone. You know, I didn't see this coming. I mean, even being part of the Free Methodist Church, the reason I came to the Free Methodist Church because I wanted to go into the black community. And I guess I've felt very grateful to God for making me feel comfortable enough to step into these white churches um, and being able to have those conversations. Yeah, we're struggling with that, aren't we? We're struggling with diversity in the church. And so you want to expand your vision of what God wants to do in your life. If we want to reach a diverse uh, people, we must be diverse. You know, a lot of diversity happens when the leadership starts to diversify and people feel like, oh, that person who's leading in this church can understand me. Nothing's going to change until we learn how to love one another. And if it doesn't happen in the house of God, where will it happen at? There's a tendency for us to overlook the gifts of other people of color. It's, it's, we overlook things. And so, we have to learn to appreciate and see the gifts that they bring us and celebrate that. We don't just serve people, we empower 
people, regardless of your ethnicity or background. So our goal is to raise up leaders, pastors, evangelists, people that sit on our boards, people that speak into the direction of the church. That's collaboration. That's how we get the best of the kingdom of God. Good news, wonderful news that we have. I took a group of 10 teens from Gary, New York, a small community of about 1,000 people, to an urban ministry trip to the oldest mission, a free Methodist mission in the city of Chicago, the Olive Branch Mission. And the city has a population of 3 million people. It was a cross-cultural experience to the max. We got on a crowded bus, and all the seats were taken, and so we lined up the aisle, all ten of us, all white. Everyone else seated was not white. We were experiencing what it felt like to be in the minority. We served in the mission there, uh, about 300 people over several days. They all had came from different backgrounds. They were all ages, all colors, all marital statuses, all backgrounds. They were, many of them, struggling with addiction. They were without jobs or close family in many regards. Some had mental health struggles. None of them had a place to, li to lay their head at night, a place to live, a place to, to eat a comfortable meal around a table shared with others. While we were ministering to them, we experienced even more their ministry to us and the experience of God's ministry to us through them in this opportunity to work across cultural lines to interact with people different from us. Many showed us gratitude, kindness, generosity, and offered encouragement. It was a cross-cultural experience I will never forget. Jesus, the early church, the Apostle John in the book of Revelation all point to the diverse multicultural makeup of the body of Christ. Jesus himself broke multiple barriers in John chapter 4 when he sat down at a well with a Samaritan woman with a sinful past. He broke the barriers of race, of gender, of religion, and of social standing so that she and her village would come to believe in him. In Acts, the early church grew as it learned how to care for Greek-speaking widows, as well as their own Aramaic-speaking widows. It grew as it led an Ethiopian court official to Christ, which brought the gospel to Africa. In Acts 8, and the early church saw a Gentile centurion, Roman, enemy, his whole family come to faith and be baptized in the Spirit in Acts 10. And the Apostle John writes in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, of the final day when Christ returns, he says, there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. The body of Christ is diverse because God so loved the world and so sent us into that whole world to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, into the ends of the earth, Acts 1.8. The free Methodist way that we've been studying over the last several weeks is our distinctive values that clarify the free Methodist identity. And this includes cross-cultural collaboration. This means that as a church... As a Free Methodist Church and as Pierce Church, which is part of this denomination, we will actively seek people of different backgrounds and cultures from us to co-labor or collaborate with in fulfilling the mission of God. B.T. Roberts, the founder of the Free Methodist Church, wrote regarding brotherhood and sisterhood. The title of the essay was Brotherhood. We should regard all humankind as our brothers and sisters. Closely allied, everyone depends on the all-sustaining power of the Most High. Christians perceive, even in detail, the impelling truth, God made one blood of every nation. 
Once that truth fixes itself in our minds, the cries of the distressed and the groans of the downtrodden pierce our souls and inerve us, inerve our spirits with an unexpected strength to alleviate suffering and deliver good news. B.T. Roberts. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Paul tells us to remember something significant. He wants to rem us to remember how desperate and dire our situation once was. The Jews in those verses referred to us Gentiles as uncircumcised, a derogatory term that identified us as outsiders, not in the in-group. We did not know of a Messiah or expect a Savior. We were illegal aliens without the privileges of citizenship. God's promises were not for us. We did not share in the covenant between God and his people. He writes there, we did not know God or have hope. But then everything changed. God did something incredible to draw us, even us, into his family. Verse 13 says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The cross changes everything, friends. We have now a relationship with God the Father by his grace through faith in Jesus. We now experience the full promises of God. Peace with God is possible, but not only peace with God, but peace with one another. Verse 14 says that Jesus has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. His purpose was to reconcile them both to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Verse 17. In the temple at the time, there was a dividing wall that kept Gentiles out of the place of worship meant only for the Jews. The Jewish historian Josephus wrote that the barrier between the outer Gentile court and the inner Jewish court had a sign that read, no foreigner may enter within the barricade that surrounds the sanctuary and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have only himself to blame for his ensuing death. Now, I don't know if that meant the temple guards would inflict capital punishment on those who violated this law, or if they were just saying, hey, if you cross this line, beware, God will strike you dead. You're not welcome here. Now, I know we would never put a sign like that on our church, right? Amen. But there are barriers that churches put up that keep people out. Are there things that make people say of church, I wouldn't be caught dead there? Is it the sideways glances they get if they dress different? Is it the frowns they receive if they smell funny? Is it the terminology of church that is foreign to them and always expected but never explained? Is it the cold shoulder that comes from someone who doesn't appreciate the hairstyle the tattoos, or the piercings? Is it the complaint about them sitting in your pew? Is it the lack of warmth from someone who doesn't like their choice of music? Is it the raised eyebrow over someone's struggle with their sexuality? Is it the emphasis on a political agenda instead of a spiritual one? Is it the lack of involvement and separation of people generationally, socioeconomically, or racially within the church? Is it the funny stare, stare a parent gets when their child acts up? Or is it the awkwardness a single parent feels if he or she comes with their kids on their own? Or the pressure a single person feels if they are not recognized of as being of value because they don't come with anyone. There are all kinds of reasons people might feel they're not welcome at any given church on Sunday, 
even if there's not a sign on the door that says they're not welcome. They can read it in faces. They can see it in cross arms. They can hear it in comments, greetings, or the lack thereof. But the New Testament makes it clear that the gospel is for all, that Jesus died for all, and that we, the church, have to be intentional and vigorous about removing barriers, cultural or otherwise, that limit people from experiencing and knowing the grace of God in Jesus Christ, so that we need to meet them where they are. They are not going to know the barriers to remove. They can't remove them. We have to take that step for them. That is an act of compassion and grace on the part of Christ followers. You see, as Paul has written in Ephesians 2, we ourselves were outsiders before, but now we are welcomed into the full body of Christ because of what Jesus has done on the cross. He formed a new family made up of those who were near to God before and those who were far from God before, but now who are brought together. He has brought, broken down the barrier between them. And now we, the church, are expected to break down barriers rather than to build them so others can experience the grace of God just as we have. Cross-cultural collaboration means we co-labor with those of different backgrounds, cultures, ethnicities, tastes, experiences, gifts, generations, different genders, different neighborhoods, different education levels, different body types, different nationalities, different experiences and political parties even, different musical preferences, the list could go on and on. And the reason we do that is because of the one thing that unites us. Jesus' sacrificial death upon the cross for our sins and the salvation that comes by God's grace for everyone who believes. Excuse me if you're watching online. I'm getting a drink. <laughs> it's too important to ever be able to speak all these words, and I'm not going to be able to if I don't get a drink. So thank you for your patience. Cross-cultural collaboration is in Pierce's DNA, as I have discovered since I came here and from what I knew before. Pierce has done a wonderful job of doing things globally to, to engage other cultures in a cross-collaborative way, including our support for missionaries and our partnership with Nzige, Rwanda, to build a school and to sponsor children and to provide for them to have an education and food and clothes. Locally, we've also collaborated with other churches like Heart and Soul Free Methodist Church in the city of Rochester, where we've gone in and helped them clean up after flood damage, and we've sent people to teach Sunday school or to provide child care or minister in one way or another. We've also helped with other ministries like Family Promise that provides emergency housing and Backpacks for Kids that supports children dealing with food scarcity in our own Churchville Chilai School District. Then there's the Thanksgiving Community Food Baskets. Have you heard about them? We're doing this to serve and minister to families in our community and in our city in a cross-cultural way that alleviates some of the pressures and stresses in life, if only for a brief time, to show the love of Jesus. In Pierce, we can continue to reach out to our community even more effectively by continuing to build bridges with people different from us, whether those differences are socioeconomic, racial, generational, or cultural. We can learn from their struggles and their spiritual journeys, even as we share our faith with them, which will enhance our understanding, encourage our growth, and increase our influence. In the process, Pierce will begin to look a little more like the kingdom of God. We can become that appetizer for the wonderful meal of all nations gathered around the throne of Jesus upon his return. Now, I love going to new places and seeing new sights, smelling new scents, hearing new languages, and tasting new foods, especially that. Now, some people don't like all those things. When I went to South Korea for a seminary class that I took, we got to enjoy a wonderful variety of Korean cuisine. By the end, one of my classmates from Jackson, Mississippi said, 
I can't wait to get back home so I can go to McDonald's. <laughs> Something's missing there. When I attended the New Hope Free Methodist Church in Rochester while I worked at the college and seminary several years ago, a group of refugees from the Congo started attending the church. We didn't know their language. They didn't know ours. They needed a ride. We began to, to pick them up and bring them to, to, to church and take them other places when there was a need. And we had their family to our house where they swam in our pool on a hot summer day laughing and splashing and cooling down in the heat. We went to their house and they welcomed us warmly giving us a meal that we knew they could little afford. Today, Heritage Munikuri is the pastor of one of our churches and ministers to other refugee families. You see, God's intent is that people from every nation, culture, ethnicity, and language would be united in Christ and commissioned together to carry out his work in the world. Let's celebrate, Pierce, that we are one in Christ and dedicate ourselves to becoming a more diverse, multicultural church that looks like the kingdom of God. I would love if we could reach dozens of new families from different cultures or backgrounds to become part of us. We could sing their vibrant songs, listen to their beautiful voices, praise with their enthusiastic dance. Yes, Free Methodist, dance in worship. <laughs> and eat their delicious food. And most important, we could rejoice and worship God, the same God who makes us one in Christ. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You may have heard this before, but it bears repeating. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. No one has preferred status or greater standing or is more exceptional than anyone else. No sin can keep any of us away from the cross, and there's no good deed that can bring us any closer to the, to the cross. Verse 18 of Ephesians 2, Paul writes, for through Christ we both, we all, have access to God the Father by one Spirit. Jesus' atoning work on the cross is life-changing. We have peace with God and peace with one another. Hostility, conflict, hatred, contempt, bitterness, resentment, destruction, jealousy, all are removed by the cross. And I think removed is too soft a word. All are destroyed by the cross. Verse 14 says he has destroyed the barrier, friends, the dividing wall of his hostility. And in verse 16, he put to death their hostility. Jesus died on the cross to overcome sin and evil, to give us eternal life, but also to break down the barriers that divide us, to put that hostility to bed, to rest, to death. Jesus' death ended hostility between Jew and Gentile, slave and free, men and women, rich and poor, black and white. But humanity continues to foster hostility, to promote it for their own selfish desires, to capitalize on it, to gain a following, to exploit it, to gain power, to further it, to gain control. Sometimes churches seem a little different from the world around us. And where we are not different, we must repent of this and seek to be, through repentance and confession, contrition, and a calling out to God, we should seek to be the answer to Jesus' prayer in John 17, 20 to 21, where he said, my prayer is that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's Jesus' prayer for us, which tells us that unity and cross-cultural collaboration is essential to our mission so that people will believe. Being the answer to Jesus' prayer depends on us aligning ourselves with the purpose of Jesus Christ, which is to bring peace between us and God and to bring peace between us and one another. 
Ephesians 2 says we are fellow citizens, family of the same household, part of a building that's being built on Jesus, the cornerstone that ties everything together. To what end? Verse 22 says, and in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We're becoming a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We're being raised up as a temple the place of worship before God in the world so that other people can be drawn to Him. If God's Spirit will dwell in us, if we are to be the temple through whom God's love, presence, and peace is made known to the world, then we must co-labor with fellow believers of every color, language, nationality, ethnic group, and culture in complete unity, as Jesus' prayer says, as He concludes, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. That's Jesus' prayer. We pursue cross-cultural collaboration around the globe and in our own neighborhood. It begins at the foot of the cross with humility, repentance, and willingness to engage and learn from others across all these different dividing lines, across these cultural lines. Because of moving our clocks back an hour last night, I decided to try and stay up a little bit later than usual by watching a movie. My choices were Unforgiven, a dark western starring Clint Eastwood, or Horton, Here's a Who. <laughs> Which did I choose? Horton the Elephant is, that's the one I chose. <laughs> Amen. No. <laughs> Horton the Elephant is the only one who has heard the people of Whoville on a tiny speck of dust. Everyone else decides he's crazy and that they need to get rid of the speck to save his sanity. But in the moment before it's destroyed, everyone in Whoville makes noise and yells at the top of their lungs, we are here, we are here, we are here, until Horton's friends hear them too and save the speck of dust. People of all backgrounds are all around us, near us, in our neighborhoods, crying out, we are here. We are here. We are here. Will we co-labor to hear them and see them so that they can be brought to Christ. For Jesus says, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Jesus says, they are here. They are here. They are here. I died for them too. The communion table that we're about to participate in conveys the idea of God's love for the whole world. It's where we gather, and his love is why we gather, around the broken body and shed blood of our Savior, even as we remember God's grace to us in this moment, may we commit to bringing his grace to everyone else. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you, the one who came for us and this whole world. Forgive us, Lord, where we have allowed our differences to separate us and keep us from sharing the message of your hope and your love and your grace with the world. Help us, Lord, to do that. Help us to be willing to, to break down barriers, to collaborate across different cultural lines, whatever they might be, that have held us back from this message of your grace to the people who you died for, who are here near us. Oh, Lord, help us to see them with your eyes. Help us to love them with your heart. Help us to share your grace with them with an open and willing spirit of gratitude for all that you've done for us and for all that you want to do for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite Denise to join me as we prepare for the Lord's Supper together.
Hear this invitation, church. You who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, who live in love and peace with your neighbors, and who intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament for your comfort and humbly bowing, make your honest confession to Almighty God. Merciful God, we confess that we need your mercy once again. We have taken your generosity for granted and have tried to take advantage of your love, always expecting your mercies we have failed to show mercy to others. We have turned our eyes from the poor. We have hardened our hearts against those who have hurt us. We have been selfish towards those closest to us. And so we humbly come to you. We ask for your merciful forgiveness and that you would teach us so we might true, be true reflections of you. Forgive our sins that we silently confess to you. Amen. Please join together with me for the Lord's Prayer. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, done on, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our sins, sins as, as we forgive, forgive those who sin against, against us. us. And, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, from evil. For thine is, is the kingdom and the power and the glory, and the glory forever. forever. Amen. O oh, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who gave with great mercy, has promised forgiveness to all who turn to you with hearty repentance and true faith, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from our sins. Make us strong and faithful in all goodness and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please join me in praying aloud. Almighty, Almighty God, God, unto whom, unto whom all, all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by, by the inspiration of the, of the Holy Spirit, Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and, and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who gave in love your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who by his sacrifice offered once for all did provide a full, perfect, and sufficient atonement for the sins of the whole world. We come now to your table in obedience to your Son, Jesus Christ, who in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we humbly ask, and grant that we, receiving this bread and this cup, as he commanded, and in the memory of his passion and death, may partake of his most blessed body and blood. Amen. In the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I invite you to take the communion elements that you have and peel back the top layer and remove the wafer of bread there. Let us partake of the bread, remembering Jesus' death upon the cross for us and feeding upon him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, Drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you, you drink it in remembrance of me. So I invite you to take the cup, and let us join in drinking this cup, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for us, and be thankful.
Heavenly Father, we praise you today for your mercy that you have shown to us again and again and again and that we've recalled and remembered and celebrated together through this simple act of partaking together of this bread and this cup. Lord, even as we have consumed these elements, Lord, help us consume you, your spirit that's now within us, that's part of our very being, part of our soul. May your spirit fill our hearts that we may faithfully carry out your work to be your light in this world full of darkness, to be your salt, to, to bring the seasoning of your grace to the people around us, in many cases very unlike us, but very much in need of your grace, just as we have experienced. Oh, Lord, help us to be faithful to this as you fill us with your Spirit to carry out this work. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join me today as we go out into a blessed week as we boldly declare our faith today. Let's say together, Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Amen. Amen.
when he shall come with the trumpet blast. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Must we stand before the throne? Amen. Jesus is Lord. That is the first great creed of the church recorded in the New Testament. I hope that's our, your creed today. It's our creed as a church. Jesus is Lord of all, and we worship him. So as you go today, may you go out in the knowledge of the love of God that is ours, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit that fills us and empowers us to carry out his mission in the world. God bless you. Have a wonderful day and a great week.